Hi, I'm Luke Sherveld. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Gaffer. Okay, I got three things. One is, I just want to give you an update from pandemic land. And then two, I got these new clamps. Well, they're new to me. I want to show them to you. And then three, a while back, I was on a job at a wax museum. So kind of a walkthrough of that. If you want to skip ahead, there are times below. All right, so just an update. Uh, <laughs> Here I am in the garage, which is kind of like, we've turned it into sort of a station for how we transfer the food after it's delivered. Then we, we hold it sort of in quarantine and then we separate it out and wash it. We've got a little pie fridge. I've been putting the cold stuff in there and then fruits and vegetables, things like that, we put in a large cooler. So yeah, you know, <laughs> it's just such an odd thing. I mean, my wife and I are here in the house alone and it's actually kind of wonderful. You know, we, uh, uh, I say it's like being stranded on a desert isle with a beautiful woman. It's like, hey, you know, life is pretty good. Then a friend of mine who has a bunch of young kids, he's like, yeah, I'm on an island too with a beautiful woman. And then we've got four angry natives. <laughs> I thought that, that actually expresses that pretty well. Uh, but you know what? So in the scheme of things, I've got it good. It's spring outside, but it also feels a little like blue velvet. You know, it's just, it's odd. It's like things really aren't as they were. And perhaps they will never be. But I like to think a little more optimistically than that. Anyway, just thinking back, you know, on March 15, when I had my little apocalyptic tirade, the day after, Bay Area counties went into shelter in place. Then that was the Monday. And then the Friday after that was the 20th. And the whole state went into shelter in place. Uh, you know, we we're just sort of the second state. First was Seattle, Washington state. Uh, then it was California. Then, you know, now like the epicenter seems to be New York. Uh, it's just going to bounce around as the numbers go up. And uh, yeah, there are still states that don't think it's going to touch them. Yeah. You know what? Um, sometimes it takes things to happen close to you before you take notice, before you take it seriously. I wish we were better at that. I wish we could understand numbers, you know, uh, exponential numbers. I wish we could, you know, sort of like global warming, you know? I mean, how different is this? It's like, it's something that's coming. We see it from afar and we still do very little about it. It's like, yeah, you know what? Then maybe we're gonna get what we get, which is, uh, uh, death. <laughs> you know? uh, wow. I mean, it's crazy. So, and then you think like, oh, you know, every year, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people die from the flu. Well, the percentage of people who get the flu and actually pass away from it is under 1%. With this, it's like maybe 2.5, 3% for older groups of people and I'm close to that, it's, it's more than that. So it's a real thing. And uh, I'm really thankful to our governor for shutting things down as much as they are. People still need to move around. So it's still gonna move, but it takes people. The virus needs people to move. The less we move, the less it can move, we can get in front of this thing. All right, enough about that in a sense, but uh, how that translates to our grip and electric world, I'm thinking we've decided to order food in because if I go out then I'm one more person out there, you know, no, we get it in, we separate it, we wash it. What if that was, what if I was a rental house and sending out my gear? How does that work, you know? Has someone figured all this out already? If you have, let me know. Otherwise, I wanna start the conversation. When we do get back, as we 
you know, sort of crawl back into production, how's that going to look? Because you think, okay, you can have gloves on, but what, every time you're going to go to craft service, that's got to come off. And then you got the new gloves, or you got to wash those gloves, or how are we going to think about all this? Because we're surrounded by metal stands, metal rigging, metal and plastic lighting units, uh, paper products, cardboard. If you think about the people in your life right now, you have to consider everybody has it. Even if they don't know it, they may have it. Well, isn't that the way we're going to have to think about gear? If gear has been handled by somebody else, don't we have to figure it could, you know, have contamination? So now, are you going to wipe it down every time you touch it? Are you going to just figure, oh, I'll wash my hands halfway through the day? You know, uh, it just seems like there needs to be protocols, procedures, and if you're on a shoot, everybody needs to be on the same page as far as what the protocols and procedures are because some people are going to be more picky about it and other people are going to be lackadaisical so is it just going to be a safety meeting are we going to have to take you know uh, a safety class in la you know how's that going to work so i'm just interested because i don't think we have a virus and then it's gone and we don't have to worry about it and we can get back to normal I think it's going to be something that we have to live with for a while, if not forever. Does that mean it takes longer to load in or load out? Or do I have to put some stuff in quarantine? You know, it's like, ah. Anyway, just putting it out there. Now, from GeForce Grips, they've got this Python clamp. And maybe you've got a ton of these already. I was kind of new to me, and I got the black version. It's uh, you know, it's got a nice spin to it and it locks down well. It's a hinged clamp. So you've got uh, just one hinge. So instead of like the Cardellini that has two jaws that are kind of separate, this has got the hinge in it. So it's only going to open as, as wide as it's going to open, but it does open nicely, very wide. And so this can go on, uh, you know, regular... Uh, speed rail and go on a box truss which is, is is nice and that's the 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 main jaw then there is this other section here and that's uh it's got like a flat area so you can actually grab smaller you know like uh five eighths three eighths uh you know nets and stuff like that there's a little uh, opening, but it's also sort of flat, so you can grab things that are, are smaller that, that maybe the main jaw might be too, although that would certainly get a baby pin as well. And, you know, it's good for 2x4, uh, 1x, and um, yeah, uh, just it, it's well, well made. It feels, feels solid. Stainless steel baby pin. And then on the end of the baby pin, you've got a, uh, a 3 8 threaded female. So, and it's a substantial pin, so it gets it far enough away. They say that um, it's got a, like a, a weight rating of um, uh, 35 pounds. So anyway, yeah, just a, a solid another piece of metal, you know, you got to think about that. Anyway, uh, I like it. So there you go. And they're reasonably priced too. I think they were like, you know, 50 ish or something like that. So check it out. Third thing. So here um, I worked with a, a wonderful group of folks. They were actually from Sacramento, San Diego, LA. And we all kind of met way early in the morning and showed up at the Madame Tussauds of San Francisco in uh, Fisherman's Wharf. So the wax museum there. And down in the basement, they've got an escape room. 
and the escape room, the theme is Alcatraz. So of course, here you see me hanging out with Clint. And so that's kind of where we started. We kind of jumped into it. We were in the cells. We were in this sort of other area uh, where we were just kind of making it up, making it feel scary, you know, with the uh, handheld and colored lights and, and uh, yeah, we were just playing, but that was, that was kind of fun. And then the majority of the museum is, has kind of pivoted well, I think, because this is a pretty, you know, wax museums have been around for a long time, but I'm too, so is in London. I remember going there when I was a kid and it felt like it had already been around since the Victorian age. I don't know, but uh, the cool thing is that it's, it's perfectly laid out for the cell phone generation. It's just selfie heaven. I mean, the whole thing, you just take pictures of yourself with well-known people and they look great. Uh, and the funny thing is that a lot of famous people, often actors, uh, but even some athletes, you know, are quite diminutive. So not as tall as you might think as they seem on the big screen. So it uh, works out pretty well to take selfies. So our main approach uh, in the museum uh, upstairs, and they've got a number of different levels, was to have sort of a a large soft fill light. And then I had a, an RGB ellipsoidal for, for one case in the, the Hitchcock area. And then uh, mostly we just used the tubes wherever we wanted and used them with, with color, with uh, uh, rainbow, with uh, party mode, you know, so we were just uh, having fun with those uh, tubes. And this was back when there was really only one vendor in the San Francisco Bay area that had them. They had maybe a couple cases of eight and we had one of them. And so it was kind of like a, a new deal. So that was fun. You know, we were just kind of like, ah, how do we use these things? But, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was fun to have a new tool that worked great and, and having, you know, being on batteries and all that, just place them however, in different shapes. And so, yeah, I know music videos were onto them way early. I just don't do a lot of music videos anymore. So, okay, none, uh, unless they're corporate. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that, that was just, uh, that was great to um, be introduced to that new tool and then start using them and purchase them myself. And, uh, but uh, I think we got them from Little Giant. They, they had them uh, first, I think, here. So there you go, an update from my California bunker. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next time. Okay, so here's one way of thinking about it. Let's say I got a little bowl of M&Ms. I got 100 M&Ms in there, and I've been told by a good source that three of them are poisonous and they could kill you. But this poison, eventually, it's going to wear off, and so in a couple months, it's going to be just fine. So I have this bowl, and I bring it to you, and I say, hey, this is what I've been told. Uh, I believe it, and actually, I heard some other folks who had M&Ms, and they're not doing so well. So uh, there's three in here. I know I don't know which ones, but um, you know, if you want M&Ms, go for it. But I, I'm I'm not. I've decided I'm not going to have them for a few months. I'll put it aside. That's your three percent. You really want those M&Ms? You want them now or you want them in three months? <laughs> you know, and then what if I'm a little older and I said, well, actually, you know, it, it might be more than three. It's like, Bleh. yeah. Why? Why not just put them aside and let it be good? You know, it's not woo woo because it's actually happening in other places. And now it, we're, we see it, it's happening right here. So leave the M&Ms alone. There you go.